Okay. All right. Okay. So, good morning. Thank you very much to the organizers for having me out. Uh, I would like to tell you about some recent work we've done using quantum Monte Carlo calculations for light nuclei and using chiral forces for the first time for a quantum Monte Carlo calculation. So this work is done in collaboration with my, uh, my colleagues, uh, Stefano Gandolfi, Joe Carlson at Los Alamos, also Alex Gazerlis, Akim Schwenk, and Evgeny Applebaum. Okay, so he, this is the outline of my talk. I'd like to start by just telling you what the goal is in an ab initio calculation for nuclei, and then specifically how quantum Monte Carlo works, and then even more specifically, why, maybe why you should care about Green's function Monte Carlo in particular. Okay, and then I'll tell you about nuclear interactions, what they are, a little bit of history, why phenomenological interactions have been used up until now in quantum Monte Carlo calculations, and then what I'll call the standard approach to chiral effective field theory for these nuclear interactions, and then a new approach. And then I'll present our results for the binding energies and radii for these light nuclei with mass number less than four. I'll tell you about some per perturbative calculations we've done, and then just briefly I want to mention some distributions we calculated just because perhaps they may uh, point to something that could be observable in differences between these interactions. Okay, and then I'll summarize, tell you about some other things we'd like to do and acknowledge. All right, so what do nuclear structure methods seek to do? We're trying to solve the many-body Schrodinger equation. Okay, and so this is the sort of one-page propaganda slide for uh, Monte Carlo. So I'll tell you in more detail. But in, in general, VMC can give you an upper bound to the ground state energy. And then Green's function Monte Carlo is a lot like diffu diffusion Monte Carlo in the sense that all you're doing is using propagation and imaginary time to project out the ground state, like the last line shows you. And uh, so, you know, in principle, you could start with any garbage you wanted for the SIL tri for the SI trial uh, and then project out the ground state. But in practice, you actually have to have a decent trial wave function. And so I'd like to tell you about the form of the trial wave function. So this is what it is. It's a symmetrized product of correlation operators that act on what we call a Jastrow wave function. And I'll try to define all those things for you. So that's what the first line says. And then these correlation operators, these uij, are just given by these radial functions, these u sub p's, and then multiplying these operators, which come from your nuclear Hamiltonian. You can include however many of them you want. For example, if you look, skip down to the bottom line now, for helium-4 and lighter, you know, it's sufficient basically to have an operator structure like this. And what I'm saying here is that this is sufficient generally to capture one pi in exchange physics. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so this is sufficient to capture one pi in exchange physics. And this, yes, as Bureau was just about to say, this is the tensor operator, which I'll actually define on a slide later. Sorry about that. Okay, and so this is what we call the Jastrow wave function, this piece right here. It's just this product of central correlation operators that act on this anti-symmetric uh, wave function. And in the case of helium-4 and lighter, you can just have this anti-symmetric wave function just be spins and isospins. As you go to P-shell nuclei and higher, it's actually more complicated because then you can no longer anti-symmetrize with just these spin and isospin degrees of freedom, so you have to include spatial degrees of freedom. Okay, so that's just, yes, please. It's true, yeah. No, 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 it's true. There are more terms that can come from the three nucleon force. In fact, you can have three nucleon interactions that are induced by the two-body interaction. But all of this is just to say, it's just a starting point for the uh, GFMC, okay? And what are these functions used? So they're basically solved by, um, they're obtained by solving a Schrodinger-like equation with the appropriate boundary conditions for nuclei, which says things like, okay, if you take one nucleon and separate it from the A minus one others, right, then the the correlation, the central correlation at least, or the product of central correlation should decay like the uh, energy difference between them, things like that. So you put in the appropriate boundary conditions, you get these correlation functions that you were just mentioning. Uh, you solve Schrodinger-like equations, and then you build it. Say it again? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, you know, so these are two-body. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. In the tail? So as I said, I mean, you can say something like, okay, you know, helium-4 or something like that. When you separate one from the others, right, you have this difference in energies between helium-4 and the triton, for example. So you use a guess, a best guess for the single nuclear separation I, I didn't understand the question. You use a, a guess for the single nuclear separation energy? 
Yes, well, yes, yes, exactly. That in principle should come up in the calculation at the end. Oh, sure, sure, sure. But this is all just to say you need to start with something decent. Yeah, OK. But I think the confusion as your U is written depends on RIJ. Yes. It's a two body distance. Yes. Yes, 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 okay, but this should still, this product here, right here, should still decay as that separation energy. Not necessarily, they're called short range correlation. They're typically short range, not long range. This is just a boundary condition. The short range behavior is all fixed by the fact that you're using the nuclear Hamiltonian when you solve these for these U sub P's. So I'm just saying you have to put in the right boundary conditions to get a decent trial wave function, but that's it. It's just a statement of how you get a trial wave function. That capture some of the you know short range physics and some of the long range yeah, physics. I might be wrong, but yeah, go ahead. The most general, I mean, the, the most common ch uh, choice for the just for correlation uh -huh. is the f at large distance it goes to one, and then at short distances you see you have correlations. No, but so that's not true here. That's a, you're talking about like a healing distance sort of behavior. Like when you have neutron matter, you do things like this. But for nuclei, this is not what you want. OK. So this works. <laughs> so maybe there's some misunderstanding about what I'm saying. Maybe I'm saying something incorrect. This is possible. But what I'm, but yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But, but the point is, is this works. You can get these correlation operators from the nuclear Hamiltonian with the appropriate boundary conditions. Well, in principle, it works without those correlations. Maybe, yeah, exactly, exactly. Because Green's function Monte Carlo projects out the ground state. But it's nice to have something that's decent to start with. No, it's a, it's a good point. OK, so let me just tell you a little bit more about it. OK, so it's known as one of the most accurate methods for solving the many-body Schrodinger equation for nuclei in this mass range. OK, and in a moment, I'll tell you sort of why we're limited to less than 12, OK? So you start with a VMC calculation, which just means you take that trial wave function I just told you about. You generate a random position. And then based on this probability, you use the Metropolis ar algorithm to sort of select new positions. OK, and so what, what does this give you? At the end of the day, you have a set of what we call walkers, which then should be distributed according to the trial wave function. Okay? And so another way of saying that is a walker knows about the 3A positions of the nucleons. Well, so we sum over all spin and isospin states, yes. And this is exactly the limitation, right? So if you look at this, this combination, 2 to the A, H, U, Z, at least in this charge basis, uh, right, it's exploding exponentially with the number of degrees of freedom. You can make certain. You can make certain subsets of this that have good other quantum numbers, but you're still losing, OK, is my point. So in the charge basis, this is the form. But there are other, uh, the isospin conserving basis looks different from this. But you're still losing to this 2 to the A, OK? And so if you sum over all these spin isospin states at the moment, carbon 12 is as high as this technique can go. OK, so great. Now we do GFMC. Your trial wave function, no matter how good of a job we do, it's imperfect. It has some excited state contamination. All right? And so you have this imaginary time propagator. Right? And if you expand your trial wave function in a set of eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, what you see is that all the excited states get this exponential damping factor. E sub i is always greater than E sub 0. So in the long imaginary time limit, all these pieces decay away. And you're left with something that's proportional to the exact many body ground state of the system. So that's cute. Uh, how do, would one deal if I have a concept which is highly degenerate if I would have like a disordered system? Yeah, so if it's highly degenerate, you'll have to go to longer and longer times. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And how do I figure out, how do I see that I have this whole manifold of disordered, I mean, of degenerate eigenstates? I mean, could I use this for this ordered many body body system? <coughs> okay, so I don't know the answer to the question. It works in nuclei because we don't have. You know, exact degeneracies. Maybe at the most you have sort of, sort of approximate degeneracies, right? But so you're talking about a mini body disordered yeah. state? I don't know much about this, so I can't say. But diffusion Monte Carlo, which is the cousin, right, which is the brother of this method, has been used in many other realms. This is just, in particular, nuclear GFMC is what I'm talking about. I mean, ideally, you would start with two different trial wave functions that live in different symmetry spaces, and, see if they go. and then you would actually out to um, the lowest state within that symmetry space, and then they could see, be actually, that you are. You could see that. 
Yeah, and the other thing is, so I, I, I say here ground state wave function, but in principle, right, just similar to what Dorte was saying, is you can, you can actually make sure that your trial wave function is orthogonal to the ground state, right? And so you can actually converge to the first excited state, if you like, or the second excited state. Yeah, I suppose that's true. Yeah. So it depends what you want. Yeah, yeah. OK, so let me just tell you a little bit more about it. Uh, you know, this, we calculate this imaginary time propagator by splitting it up into small pieces and then iterating an equation of this form. So this Green's function is kind of a complicated animal. It depends on all this, the positions and uh, spin and isospin states of the particles. OK, but so we can calculate it. It's not that difficult. It's possible for local and non-local potentials, actually. All right, and then this equation is just trying to tell you, so what is it? It's essentially, it's a, it's a random walk. You start at some position, right? And then you propagate an imaginary time to different positions. And that's how you end up with psi at some particular time tau. So it's a stochastic integration. OK, so what can we do with this? We can calculate what we call mixed estimates. You know, ideally, if you look at some expectation value, what you'd really like, right, then is to have psi of tau on both sides. In practice, that's difficult, not impossible, but difficult to do. And so we settle for these mixed estimates where you have the trial wave function on one side and psi of tau on the other side. If the difference between psi trial and psi of tau is not significant, you know, you can make this extrapolation. And in general, our wave functions are pretty good, the trial wave functions. So you can make this extrapolation to get after the thing you were really interested in in the first place. The great thing is, of course, for ground state energies, the operator is the Hamiltonian, which commutes with the Green's function. And therefore, this really is exact. So the mixed estimate really is the ground state energy that you were looking for. So that's a nice feature. So I'd like to move on and just talk about nuclear interactions as a nuclear physicist sees them. OK, so you know one of our goals is to describe and calculate properties of nuclei using bare interactions, bare nucleon-nucleon interactions. And where does that come from? We all understand that QCD is the underlying theory. But at the energies that we're interested in, in this region here, really it's protons and neutrons, nucleons, which are the relevant degrees of freedom. OK, and so this leads immediately to the idea of a nucleon-nucleon potential. All right, so we have a non-relativistic Hamiltonian of this form. You have a kinetic energy, a two-body interaction, a three-body interaction, and in principle, higher-body interactions. Now, there's some evidence to suggest from phenomenology that these are small, and maybe even from chiral effective field theory that these are subleading order. All right, so up until now, there have been two choices, broadly. You have either a local real space phenomenological potential, like argons V18, or you have a non-local momentum space-based effective field theory potential, like this N3LO of Entum and Mach light that Sophia was telling us about yesterday. Okay? But this is a problem for us. Okay? We can calculate the Green's function for a non-local potential, but if we attempt to use it, in a quantum Monte Carlo calculation, we run into difficulties, statistical errors and things like this. And you can sort of understand this, right? So Sophia was telling us yesterday that if you have an argon potential that has a really hard core at the origin, say in the central channel, right? Then in momentum space, what this ends up doing, right, is coupling low to high momentum. And so if you work in some basis set method, this is a nightmare because you need to have an extremely large basis set. It's sort of the inverse case for us, right? So if you have a non-local potential, and you Fourier transform it to real space and attempt to use it in a Monte Carlo calculation, you suddenly have non-trivial probabilities for your nucleons to jump five, six fermis. And the idea of a Monte Carlo calculation, right, is you have this sort of diffusion of these nucleons through the space. And this doesn't make a lot of sense using a potential like that. So it can be done. It's not that it's impossible. It's just the statistical errors are not acceptable. But there's something that I'm going to yes? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's, tr yeah, that's true. That's true. And so I'm not saying it's out of. I'm not saying it's ruled out. Yeah. Actually, I'm just saying it'd be nice if there were a local yeah, chiral effective field theory potential. Well, the, the, the correlation is that it probably shouldn't be a big problem. You're right. Yeah, I agree with you that in in principle it should be done. I guess later maybe you show something like the local energy as a function of configuration space, so that one can see where the um, fluctuations are. 
No, I don't show this here yet. I was just mentioning it because, so the thing I will tell you is that my collaborators have <laughs> made an effective field theory potential, which is local up to N2LO. And now we can use it in quantum Monte Carlo without making major renovations, if you will, to the method. <coughs> Okay, so just if you're not familiar, I wanted to talk to you about the structure of Aragon's potential because there's history here. And, uh, you know, the way that we think from our community is guided largely by this potential. Okay, so you have three parts essentially. You have an electromagnetic part, and then one pion exchange, and then essentially phenomenology to account for your ignorance at short distance. All right, and so if you take these two last terms, the strong portion, you can write it in this operator expansion. There are 18 of these operators, and that's why it's called argon V18. So the first 14 of these are these charge-independent operators. L is just the relative angular momentum. S is the total spin. The sigma and taus are just the poly spin matrices that act in spin and isospin space. This tensor operator, which I wrote earlier, is actually defined here. Okay. And there's an isospin tensor operator. So, you know, it's defined in sort of an analogous way. Okay, so that's the structure. And here are results from the argon group, okay, using GFMC and these phenomenological potentials. And I think the story I'm supposed to tell here, right, is that it's pretty good. It's pretty amazing. So there are lots and lots of ground state and excited state energies. And on average, the error here is, you know, something like 1%, just not bad. Okay, but, and I think it's an important but, these nucleon nucleon potentials have only been phenomenological up until now for GFMC. Okay. Okay, so then let me tell you about chiral effective field theory, as I understand it. So this page, I think, Bira may have no problem with. I'm saying simply that. It, okay, okay. In principle, chiral effective field theory makes a more direct connection between QCD and the nucleon force. And so Weinberg's prescription is simply this. If you start from the most general Lagrangian, consistent with the symmetries of your underlying theory, and if you define a power canting scheme, it doesn't have to be this one, that orders the diagrams, then what you should end up with is the most general S matrix, which also obeys those symmetries. Okay? And I suppose probably even at this point, maybe you do diverge. So. Okay, so it's an expansion in powers of Q over lambda chi, where lambda chi is some symmetry breaking scale. For example, it's typically taken to be 1 GV, the chiral symmetry breaking scale. And Q is some soft momentum scale, which is in the nucleon, or nucleus. OK, and so if you were completely unfamiliar with this, then I'm just trying to tell you, if you look at leading order, right? You have a contact interaction, one pi on exchange, and this leads to the very famous uh, you know, one pi on exchange in nuclear physics. This is written in momentum space in this case. OK, so as I told you, non-locality for quantum Monte Carlo is a problem. So what are the sources for of non-locality in the standard approach? OK, the approach used in this entman mockley potential and in this Eppelbaum, Glockel, and Meisner. You have to iterate the pion exchanges, essentially solve the Schrodinger equation. And to do this, you have to cut off the high momentum behavior. And that's what this regulator does. Unfortunately, the regulator of this form even if nothing else was a problem, if you Fourier transform, you'll end up with a non-local potential. But in addition to that, there are actually contact interactions which are proportional to this variable k, which is the momentum transfer in the ex what's called the exchange channel, or you can just think of it as the average momentum. And this also leads to problems. A Fourier transform of a, of a function you know, in this variable doesn't lead to a local potential. It's true. In fact, in the earlier papers, right, it was not like this. Or Donez and things, right? They did not use such a regulator. Yeah, exactly. But this is the choice that's often made in these. And it's a problem for quantum Monte Carlo. OK, so now I want to tell you about a new approach, OK? Which is just simply inspired by the idea that at least up to N2LO, the pi n exchange potential is really only a function of this exchange, Q. And if there were no other problems, then, you know, you Fourier transform, and that really is a local potential. But I also mentioned that there was these contacts which were proportional to k. But the interesting thing is that at least up to this order, n to LO, there's a certain amount of freedom because of anti-symmetry that allows you to select only a certain subset of the contacts. Now, the typical choices were just made for convenience, but you can make a different set of choices that essentially eliminates 
all of the contexts which are proportional to k. I say almost because one does remain, but it looks a lot like a spin orbit force. And this is already in the argon force, too, so it's not that big of a deal. It's something we can handle. Um, I have one question. Actually, how does one argue in the objective field theory that with this momentum regulator one breaks, for example, Galilean invariance, or because it's just acting on momentum, not on energy, therefore Galilean transformations are not preserved? I don't know the answer to this and question. And how does this conflict with the symmetries that one wants to have? Yeah, I don't know the answer to this question. Then if, if you uh, that if, if you are able to take the cutoff to be very large, then there are no problems. Right? Because then you can minimize whatever error you have uh, from the cutoff. But you break the symmetries. You could in principle. Yeah. Uh, as long as you can take the cutoff to be very large. Now that said, you yes. can take the cutoff to be very and large. And then you break symmetries it, it could be, yes, uh, it, it could be. Uh, and another That's a good point. That yeah, please go ahead. You are pretending that this is a phenomenological potential, but I mean, in the potential itself, there are loops. Yes. And uh, my guess is that you are not going, you have not gone back and changed, I mean, you are not taking the same regulator here as you took for the loops. That's correct. So, in so fact, for you right there. Contributions that go as one cutoff over another, which do not have. A which may not be small. Uh, yes. Yeah, this is, a, that's a, it's an important question. Uh, so, well, will they be small? I guess I don't know. OK, so let me say some words, and then we'll talk about whether or not it's, it could be small. OK, so this is one source of, a, of regulation, then, as Bira was saying. You know, there's, here's one that comes in just when you, try, when you solve the lippmann schwinger equation. So you can regulate it, the one pion exchange stuff or the other pion exchange stuff directly in real space, which is nice for us because it ends up being local. And as I said, then you can do some tricks to eliminate almost all proportionality to k. OK, but as Bira said, you have these loop diagrams, which you can write in this spectral function regulation, um, or this spectral form. And then, yes, absolutely, you, know, you could use dimensional regularization, I suppose, at this stage. But, but on the other hand, you can also use a cutoff. And uh, this is what this lambda tilde is. And so it is a different cutoff. This value will be something like 1,000 MeV, or 1,400 MeV. This value is 1.0, 1.1, 1.2, which corresponds roughly to something like 400, 450, 500 MeV. So if I have something like r naught over lambda tilde, is this small? I don't know. Half. So does one mix up quantum calculations at that point and introduce it to cutoffs? Mix up quantum fluctuations? Yeah, I mean, don't I want to have, for example, an RG flow, which is local in RG space? Oh. I don't know the answer, yeah. Look, I understand that there are issues. Bira and I have talked all week about uh, various issues with this approach. Having said that, I think that if you think of argon and the right chiral effective field theory as being maybe orthogonal directions, I'd still like to move in that direction. right? I'd like to rotate towards effective field theory. And so I think this is a step in that direction. OK, so please, yeah, go ahead. This, I think, so this is, I'm <coughs> ignorant here. This, I believe, is a function you get from looking at the pion exchange loops. So it's, what's the shape of VC of R? I, didn't, I don't show it. You, yeah, I don't show it. No, I do know the shape. So I don't show it. I mean, OK, so <coughs> depending on the order, you know, OK, if you have argon that looks something like this. Fine. So then R's in, at N2LO is also very similar, but not quite as hard. How hard? I guess I don't know the answer. I think it's maybe on the order of hundreds of MeV, but I don't know if it's 500 or 600. Five is a lot. No, I'm not saying it's yeah. soft. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. But there's, a, there's more than one definition of hard, right? It's not just the central part of the potential which plays a role, right? There's also things like the tensor force and how strong this is that also makes a potential hard or not. So I still don't know the answer to the question that I really want to know, which is that can Sophia use this potential? And I don't know, of course, yet. We'll see. We'll have to see. <laughs> Even if that's the case, OK, we'll talk later. So what you end up with is, what's that? Talk about later? Yeah. 
Okay, so what you end up with is essentially what we could, you call, could call like a V7 potential, right? So it has these first seven operators. I mean, in addition, it also has these uh, charge independence breaking operators. It just doesn't have the, say, 8 through 14 that argon did. Okay. So if you, if you read it, it's like this. So 1, 1, <laughs> 1, 2. So I'd have to do the math, right? Two. It's something like at this stage right here, multiplying. You don't have a spin orbit, an isospin independent or isospin dependent spin orbit, and you don't have an isospin dependent or an independent L squared or an L squared sigma dot sigma or an L dot s squared. You don't have any of those. So you just have a spin orbit without an isospin dependence, and all the ones below, of course, too. Okay, and so. You have to fit to phase shifts, right? This is where you make contact with experiment. And so here are the fits. They're done in different ways in the sense that at leading order, you fit to lower energies. At next leading order, you fit to slightly higher energies. So for example, leading order, it's fit up to 50 MeV and no more. At NLO, it's I think up to 100 or 150. And for N2L, maybe all the way up to even 200. Okay, and then these bands come from varying both this lambda tilde the spectral function regulator cutoff, and also this R0, which comes into the lippmann schwinger equation. So, so I believe it's uh, 1,000 to 1,400 on this lambda tilde. Mm -hmm. And uh, this R0 is this 1.0, 1.1, 1.2, which roughly corresponds to 400 to 500 MeV. And why is that the range? Why that range? Yeah, why OK, so there's, there's a couple of ways to answer this question. Yeah, so there's a couple of ways to answer this question. So there's one paper that was done by uh, Evgeny and Daniel Phillips where they discussed this multiple scattering series for mesons, right? And so if you have, uh, if you look at this scattering series that you get for imagining that you have a meson that comes in and scatters many times between two nucleons and then leaves, and you try to resum this, you can show that there's a cut in momentum space in certain regions if you approach it from effective field theory. And this corresponds to some pole in real space, okay? And it's this pole that they're worried about if you go below, say, 0.9, Fermi's, okay, for the nucleon-nucleon problem. Okay, so that's one answer to the question. The other answer is on the other side, if you go above 1.2, you know, you're beginning to get into the realm where maybe you're not, uh, maybe you're almost to the size of the nucleon, right? Or, or the nucleon-nucleon distances and things like this. So it maybe doesn't make any sense to talk about having cutoffs at this size. But then also, of course, there's the standard answer, right? Which is something you know well that Entenmann Mach light and uh, EGM potentials have difficulty going beyond, say, 600, 700 MeV, right? Yeah, but yeah. Not, if I understand, it's rederived, I mean, refitting, right? So. Yes. You could, maybe you don't find that it's difficult, but I don't know. Yeah, that's true. I don't know the answer. I, th I believe it has something to do with those three answers. Yeah. yeah. Yes, please. Sure. So, so you you, approach, you you assume that you have a form of the two-body interaction like you wrote here. Yes. Approach, you see, so. But now what you what you're going to fit is the four factors E C W C D S and so on, correct? No, I suppose that's not true. You feed all this into the Lippmann Schwinger equation and you get phase shifts. And the phase shifts No, so I mean you fit contacts. I'm sorry, you fit contacts which are appearing in these potentials. So what is what are those you see potentials? Yes, I don't have them written down. Uh huh. Yes. They had some finite range potentials there. Finite range potentials. Because of the regulator. Perhaps, perhaps because of the regulator. You take delta functions, for example, and yeah. and spread them out a bit. Of yeah. course, yeah, in 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 exactly this way, actually. Yeah, but basically, that was what they did. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But you fit contacts. No, no, exactly. Yes, yeah, so this was a nucleon, and this was a neutron-only potential that they wrote about last year. So now it's neutron-proton. Same procedure. Yes, same procedure with maybe some slight changes. Yeah, 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 yeah. And of course. Here. No, no, please, please. I, I enjoy it. <laughs> no, well. <laughs> Do I agree with that? <laughs> if, if they did, you should have your higher order within the band of the lower order. Right? If, if 
you know, so. There's an, a real estimate of, of the uncertainty. For example, take the, the 3D1 channel. Your bands are all moving, right? And you're not nested within each other. Yeah, except yeah, yeah, yeah. Except at very low, low yeah, yeah. energy. Yeah, yeah, and we also have this issue which you've talked about, which appears in the other potentials, EGM and EM2, which is that in, in a couple cases, let me see if I can find one, right? It appears maybe even that at N2LO, you may be getting further away. I don't see one. Yeah, yeah, but it happens sometimes too. And this is, of course, an issue. But it's also an issue which is present in the ENM and EGM potentials. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm not claiming to solve the problems that you have pointed out. No, no, but also... Yeah. Which I appreciate. It is some estimate of the theoretical uncertainty. I think that that's fair. I think it's fair to say it's some estimate of the theoretical uncertainty. It's OK. It's a lower bound. OK, sure. OK, so these are the phase shifts. All right. Let's talk about some results. These are not quantum Monte Carlo results because it's just the Deuteron. But it's the place to start, right? So you have wave functions. You can see the variation is so small, uh, you can't even really see the differences, I suppose, in the S or D waves. OK? And here are the results at leading order next to leading order and next to next to leading order for the binding energy, OK? And I do think it's nice because I do think it shows a convergence, in some sense at least, the fact that this gap is much, much wider than this gap. I agree. In this case, it does not. You'll see in the larger nuclei, it, it does have a difference. It does have a role to play. OK, Okay. so here are the binding energies for the A equals 3 systems, so helium-3 and the triton. OK, and there I think you really can see some difference in the cutoff variation, right? So here, this uncertainty is quite a bit bigger, I think, than, than here. OK, it's interesting to me that these were so overbound. Maybe it's expected, I suppose, if you look back at the phase shifts. You know, to some degree, 1s0 is one of the most important phase shifts, right? In a leading order, you can see it's extremely attractive at larger energies. So maybe it's not a surprise. So does this include three-body force quantum I should have said this originally. So of course, any, <laughs> any calculation using chiral effective field theory at N2LL that doesn't include a three-body force is incomplete, and that's what this is. It's incomplete. So that's the next thing to do is include the three-body force. But we want to do it in a way that's consistent, right? So I want to do it in a way that uses the exact same regulator and the same uh, cutoffs and all these things in such a way that I really feel that I've derived them in concert with one another. OK? And this is helium-4. Uh, you see the same sort of trend. Of course, it's extremely overbound at leading order. And the error band is, well, it's quite large especially compared to next to next leading order. And here is a point that just shows if you only have the two-body argon potential, you get a similar sort of result. Not that we're trying to converge to argon, right? But it at least shows sort of a reasonable value. OK, and so uh, at this point, I haven't really been varying this SFR cutoff, this lambda tilde. OK, but I did just to show you that it doesn't have a huge impact on things. OK, so. At next to next to leading order for helium-4, if you use the 1,400 instead of the 1,000, right, you get a slight change. But it's less than 2%. It's an MEV, maybe. Also, I didn't put an error bar for experimental data. I mean, I didn't put an error bar for experimental data. In this case, it's much smaller than, than my theoretical uncertainties. I don't know that you would see it, yeah. So this is my sort of universality slide, which is just uh, to say that the Tian line can come in, right, even if you have a sort of poor resolution potential, OK? Because really, all you need to capture is the scattering lengths and uh, perhaps the three-body parameter, right? And so if you have a better resolution potential, then you might expect that it should, of course. So anyway, this is a minimal test to see that at least they lie along something that looks like a line. Yes, 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 yes. So these are our calculations and, here. Uh, uh, you have error, 
Oh, of course, yeah, they're there, they're there. I, sh I should have said it, right? The, this, these are statistical, these are Monte Carlo statistical errors. You can't see them. Yeah, you can't see them, but they are there. <laughs> of course. Uh -huh. And here, actually, they're in both directions, right? So that's why the dots look a little fat. That's an interesting question. Yeah, I think it is possible. My impression is impossible. Impossible? You'd have to break it pretty badly, right? You'd have to get. No, I didn't say it proved anything. I just said it's a minimal it's test. A test. It's a test, right? If you got this terribly wrong, right, something would be wrong. <laughs> Yeah, sure, fine. It's a mistake, yes. Yeah, fine, fine. Something is wrong. Yeah. Fine. It's, that's a fair point. <coughs> okay, and so then I just wanted to show you radii. So these are, these are the so-called proton point radii, right? So if you have the charge radius, you have the charge radius for the proton and the charge radius for the neutron, then this is how this proton point radius is defined. Okay, and so that's what I show here, both experiment and our calculations for the A equals 3 systems. Maybe. Yeah. Everybody forces you know, on to Yeah. The radius can change a lot. Yeah. So, it, so in fact, I was just thinking about this this morning because in helium four, it's not quite there, right? And so, but I think I think that in, I think that what Oral said is correct. I think that the shoe body force will fix up the binding energies, and in the case of the radii, it can't change them that much. But maybe here it can change it just enough to give you the radius. There is no You're, it could be. It could be that there is. So this is, of course, just some first operator. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. There could be a current contribution, but I didn't calculate it. Is this a big change? Oh, I don't know. So in your calculations, since, since you have this local version of the, of the chiral potential, it <coughs> should also occur is that, that you couple very high momentum and low momentum states. Yeah, that could be from this picture. So the, the cutoff in your potential is 400 MeV. So then, so I, I would in, yes. in, your, in your Green's function Monte Carlo that there is no cutoff of that sort, right? You just let this. There is no momentum cutoff in this case. No, they walk yeah. wherever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah. that, um, and you you still can describe these nuclei. Yes. So from that, I would conclude that the, what the argon people have been saying that it's important. Uh, to have the potential good at very large momenta because that all goes into the calculation. That's just wrong because your potential that doesn't describe this gets the same results. Are you surprised? No, uh, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I don't have a side. I, I like to see the proof, right? I don't have a side. I just I think that maybe it's premature to make that conclusion. Maybe, but maybe not. Yeah. But we say maybe why? OK, so well, I'll get there, I suppose. But ultimately, it has to do with the fact that there's this uh, distribution. You can calculate this longitudinal, longitudinal distribution. And there are, of course, differences. And these differences do point to differences in short range behavior of the interactions, which may have something to do with long or high momentum behavior, which may or may not be observable. <laughs> That's why I say maybe it's premature. Okay, so, but, but I'll come back to this. I'll come back to this. Here you are, yeah. um, at, at this, you see the differences at observable that are at the momentum scale of the order of the cutoff. I mean, yeah. what I remember, uh, that's true, that's true. Yeah. That even for low momentum observables, yeah. you have the same sensitivity. What about but here? I, anyway. Yeah, no, no, you're right. It's at the order of the cutoff. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, I would see some yeah, yeah, fair. It's fair. Yeah. It's fair. OK, so let me come back to that. OK, so that's it for the radii. All right, so we also wanted to understand OK, this is a large correction in some sense, right? But this appears to maybe be a small correction, right? So can you do perturbation theory between the different orders? So that's what this is. is it's this sort of first order perturbation theory calculation. You use the NLO wave function, N2LO operator, and you ask for the energy, right? And so these are these points here. If you do the, the perturbation, so you take NLO plus the perturbation, right? And that's what you get here. And so you can see in this 1.2 Fermi case, which 
you have to think in a sort of inverse way, right? This is the softest potential, the 1.2. Uh, it's OK, right? It's a small correction. And in the 1.0 case, the hardest potential, maybe it's not so great. OK? So is it converging? Well, it's difficult to know. Quantum Monte Carlo is very good at getting ground state energies, right? If you want to do second order perturbation theory, at least naively, you might think you need many, many excited states. And so second order perturbation theory is difficult in Quantum Monte Carlo. But it's not impossible. Yes? Is this calculated with the mixed estimator? It is. Yeah, and then you and then you do this extrapolation. That's right. And, and how much does the extra, extrapolation change the mixed value? How much does it change? That's a good question. I don't I don't remember offhand. I remember thinking that it was acceptable. It was small enough. Yeah. 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 So the issue is just that you know. Okay, we have. I talked all about the fact that we can get this wave function as a function of tau, right? And then take tau to infinity. And so, of course, what you'd like if you calculate some observable is this. But we have Hamiltonian here, so good age. Fine. And then, uh, uh, oh, but you don't is the problem. It's yeah, you don't. Part of the Hamiltonian yeah. Case, so it's like a potential term. Yeah, so I will. But, but it's the same Hamiltonian used for evolution of the calculation. No, so, okay, so you want me to be explicit? I'll show you explicitly what no, we do. But the correction is first order perturbation. Yes. So, so. Also, you mean for the, for the first order perturbation? Yeah, there will be a mixed, exactly. Yeah, okay. <laughs> there actually may be another way to do this using. Um, well, actually, yeah, I yeah. think the comment makes sense. I think okay. you should, should look at that. I'm uh, just asking. I mean, there uh, could, could be something useful to look at. Yes, to know the size of it. We at least looked at it, determined it was smallish, acceptable in some way. Well, so uh, let me show you something else, though, which is just that, OK, so you, I wanted to get some hints. So I looked at just the Deuteron system where you don't have to worry about quantum Monte Carlo, right? And you can really solve the problem. OK. The trend is interesting, though, because the first order correction is like the first order correction in helium-4. It's smallish and positive. OK, so that's what this chart shows you. These are just the NLO Deuteron binding energies at the different cutoffs. These are the N2LO binding energies. And then what's in between is you know, the first order correction, the second order correction, the third order <coughs> correction using perturbation theory. And so I think you can see pretty clearly that in the 1.2 case, you, know, you are getting, of course, you get a negative contribution at second order. Uh, but you even get a negative contribution at third order. And it's smaller and smaller and smaller. So it really does appear to be converging. Less may be clear in this case, but still. OK, yes? No, because why do it? Why do this? This is not something that you want to do necessarily. To improve? Yes, but I want to solve the bare nuclear interaction problem. I don't want to do any softening. I'm just trying to say, is it actually perturbative? Just because you have a difference in energies that's small, I'm not totally convinced that that means it's perturbative, right? So it's really a test. Is it perturbative? And I think maybe the answer is in certain cutoff regions. Yeah, I think maybe it is. Okay. So we'd like to do a second order calculation for the alpha particle, and this is maybe something we will do. Of course. Maybe I said maybe it's something you don't want to do because I mean, after all, what you'd like to do is start with the bare interaction and then use the bare interaction. Why do we have to soften it? Because if it is convenient, I will do it. If it's right, it's fine. But you introduce extra problems. Is the is the thing right? Problems that maybe are handleable, right? But they're extra problems. As long as the approximations are controlled. But do, if you don't have to introduce more approximations, well, I think don't I do it. If you but if you don't have to introduce extra approximations, yes, then you wouldn't. Better, yeah. Okay. So, okay. There is a no saying. Yeah. All right. So then I just wanted to show distributions, which we can calculate. So this is the proton distribution. And I mean, I guess I just think it's interesting because at leading order, you have very different behavior than at next to leading order and next to next to leading order. And I mean, I guess that's reflected in the radii, right? Is that the 
binding energy effect? Isn't the binding energy effect? I suppose maybe it is. I mean, I think that the potential just only captures sort of scattering length like physics, right? And so you don't end up getting a really good, accurate description of the nucleus. So this is for helium-4, by the way. I should have said that. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. R1.2. R0 is 1.2. Yeah, I should mention that. So here is this two-body total isospin-1 distribution Okay, for the helium-4. And in the top panel, I do set R0 to 1.2 and then look at the different orders. And in the bottom panel, I just choose a particular chiral order and then vary the cutoff to see how things change. Okay. In the top plot, you have uh, the top figure. This is log scale, but in the bottom plot, it's not. So, just to, so you know what you're looking at. Okay, and this is what I was saying to Hans: is is this difference in short range behavior observable? But maybe you were saying even if it is, it's still of the range of the cutoff. In which case, yeah, maybe it still invalidates what was said before. Okay, so the Fourier transform of this distribution is at least related to the Coulomb sum rule. Okay, so the Coulomb sum rule is this quantity that you can measure. This is the form factor of the nucleon. This is what's called the longitudinal-longitudinal distribution. And that longitudinal distribution is the Fourier transform of that t equals 1 distribution. And so I showed it before. Um, of course, at low momentum transfer, you have it's indistinguishable. But the differences really come in you know, maybe around the order of the cutoff. But still, this is the region where there is data, and so it would be interesting to do this calculation carefully and fully and see if there are any observable consequences or not. OK, so I'd like to summarize. I think it's important to do nuclear structure calculations because I think they really probe nuclear Hamiltonians, which then in some sense is trying to learn about low energy QCD. So in quantum Monte Carlo, we've had these phenomenological potentials. They've been very successful. But depending on your point of view, maybe they're unsatisfactory. And so it would be nice to have some more direct connection to QCD. And I think chiral effective field theory offers that. All right, and so now we have the first GFMC calculations of light nuclei with chiral effective field theory interactions. I think it really paves the way for a systematic and careful study of these uncertainties that come from the cutoffs, especially in larger and larger nuclei. We can do carbon-12 in principle. So the binding energies are at least reasonable to, for experiment, and they're also similar to phenomenological potentials. Take that for what you will. And the, I think the radii show expected trends. The softest of the potentials displays perturbative behavior and its difference between N2LO and NLO. And also, I think that there's a possibility that the, that the different high momentum and short range behavior of these interactions could be um, observable. So what will we do next? Well, we'll include this three nucleon force. So work is, under, is, un, is on the way right now uh, to include this three nuclein force at N2LO. And uh, we would like to, I'm sorry, three nuclein force. Uh, we'd like to include the two nuclein force up to N3LO. Now, at that point, you do run out of the freedoms to sort of get rid of those K-dependent contact interactions. So you really want to make a non-consistent calculation too? So no, we can do non-local potentials. And in fact, no, 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 no. yeah, yeah. Oh, I suppose, yeah, yeah, we will. We will. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> first, I'll do a consistent calculation. Yeah, first, which is improvement. And then I'll commit the same crime as you. I'm just kidding. Okay, and so we'd like to extend to larger nuclei. And we can possibly do a second order perturbation calculation in GFMC. So, like I said, naively, it doesn't seem possible, but actually, maybe there's some tricks. So, you could potentially write down. Something like this. So these are ground states. You have delta V and then you have delta V. So this is the propagator, delta oh, V. You have the propagator. Yes. And uh, you can show that this is essentially equivalent to second order perturbation theory. 
And so this is the sort of thing that Monte Carlo is really good at, right? Operators, ground states, integrations. So it's possible. So, and then I'd like to perhaps do a more careful study of the Coulomb sum rule. All right, and so. Sure, sure. Oh, no, 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 it shouldn't be any problem because you're just talking about putting operators in between the wave function. So what kills you is the number of degrees of freedom in the wave function, right? But it doesn't, doesn't uh, increase the number of components. No, no. It's just, a, it's just a more complicated operator. And of course, it'll re require a sort of mixed extrapolation okay. because it's not a Hamiltonian, obviously. But, but yeah, of course. Okay, and so I'd just like to thank my collaborators and thank you for your time. Yes. Yes? So, towards the beginning, you said you, uh, you find your use of the correlation functions by solving Schrodinger like equations. Yes. Right? So, yes. why did you call this Schrodinger? Is it Schrodinger equation? Or just the way that those equations are? So, they're Schrodinger like because they don't just involve the nuclear Hamiltonian. You also add a phenomenological potential, like a Wood Saxon like kind of thing, right? So that you get the right boundary conditions, like I was talking about earlier. No, but it's not quite the Schrodinger equation, right? It's not the. Why is it the Schrodinger like? What makes it not? Uh, because it's not the Hamiltonian. It's not. Oh, I see what you're saying. It's still the Schrodinger equation. If you think of a different interaction, yeah, but I don't like saying this because when I say solve the Schrodinger equation, <laughs> I mean with the Hamiltonian, the correct Hamiltonian. But I, I hear, yeah, I hear what you're saying. I see. Schrodinger equation with a phenomenological interaction added to enforce the boundary conditions you want. <laughs> He's very kind. I had hoped that there would be a significant difference for the chiral effective field theory interactions, that somehow perhaps you could run for a shorter time and get better errors or something like that. But in fact, it ends up being very comparable. So I think this, I think this factor is one to first order. Uh, so why do it then? I don't know, because it's chiral effective field theory. It has maybe a more direct connection to, I like to say maybe, because I understand there are people in the audience who, who disagree with almost from the second step, maybe, of the chiral effective field theory part. Uh, but nevertheless, OK, so if Bira gets to a point where he has an NLO or N2LO potential, depending on its form, right, we could do these same tricks. We could make the contact, we could switch contact interactions such that they're not proportional to K. We can make a local potential. We could do GFMC with his potential. And then everybody would be happy. Right. Yes. Could you just actually go away from the Weinberg counting by integrating the potential at the higher orders, but do it strictly perturbatively? Does it get anyone away from functions and then just include all diagrams? At least for my theory. Sure, I think the answer is yes. I think ultimately you could do something like that. It would be nice to see if that actually gives you conversions in the same order of magnitude as iterating. Mm -hmm. As, no, so as Beer and I have talked about, as you do this, the, yeah, because of this issue with the reabsorbing the yeah the divergences and things so like this. Same the way you try to explore this the Bartizimans, right? By then looking at yes. square of over square of over. Yes. Okay. So if there are no other questions, let's thank you all again. Okay. Thank you. Do I just press it?